one two CG seminar number two hundred and twenty three, and today's topic is women's leadership in higher education, and we we're approaching this as we as we do with all topics globally. Uh, and this webinar today is being presented in cooperation with the Boston College-based uh, Center for International Higher Education. Um, many of you will know its work, and it's it's especially it's uh, it's important publications from books to newsletters that constantly inform us about the sector worldwide, and also with the American Council on Education. So this is tremendous for us to have these two partners to work with today. And um, it's a great pleasure uh, to hand over at this point, the chairing of the uh, webinar to Rebecca Schendel. Rebecca is the Managing Director of the Centre for International Higher Education, and she will introduce our cast of thousands, our great panel, uh, to discuss this important topic. This is the first of two webinars on the topic and we'll introduce the second webinar, which will be happening in two days time at the end of this webinar. So Rebecca, over to you. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you to all of you for being here. And thank you, thank you, Simon, for agreeing to share this platform with us um, and also for, for agreeing with the importance of this topic. Um, as you can see, we have quite a, an illustrious panel this morning. I won't spend a, too much time. Um, I want to be sure that the speakers have as much time as possible, but I wanted to start off just with a little context. So for those of you who are joining us from the CG side, as opposed to from the CIHE side, you may be less familiar with the Center for International Higher Education here at Boston College in the US. We've been in operation since 1995, doing um, research and scholarly analysis on higher education from a global and comparative perspective now for 26 years. And it's exciting to continue that tradition. One thing that uh, we've always, always been very focused on at CIHE is, is research that is useful to inform policy and practice. And another thing is, uh, research that's done in collaboration with others. So I think that this webinar uh, folk, um, joint shared by CG and CIG really exemplifies that uh, sort of collaboration that we have with individuals around the world as uh, manifest by this panel, but also with research centers around the world. And just to say on a personal note, as somebody who used to be affiliated with CG when I worked at UCL, it's really a delight to be able to have this to have this panel today. So as Simon mentioned, this is the first of a two part webinar series today and Thursday, both webinars are, are looking at the results of a, a brief that was recently published, open access, I'll put the link in the chat later on so that you can access it if you'd like, um, as part of the International Briefs for Higher Education Leaders series, which is a series that has been produced collaboration between CIHG and the American Council on Education uh, for the past nine years or so. This was the ninth iteration. I'll let Robin mostly speak to, to the brief uh, series and where it came from, but just to say that this ninth edition is looking specifically at the very important topic of women's representation in leadership in higher education. And today's seminar is really looking at the comparative aspect of what we did with the brief. The brief enjoys con uh, in, employs contributions from 14 contributors from around the world, talking about what you might call the state of play when it comes to women's leadership in higher education from their particular context context, trying to draw lessons across contexts. And that's what we're hoping to do with our webinar today. Um, and as a result, we decided we wanted as many voices as possible on the stage. So we've invited many people, all of whom have the very daunting task of presenting their country's context in two to three minutes in order to keep to time. So I will be the taskmaster um, advancing us through. But just to briefly introduce our panel, we're going to start off with Robin Helms, who is the Assistant Vice President for Learning and Engagement at ACE. Robin will give some context from ACE's perspective on the briefs and how they fit in with ACE's work. And then we'll dive into our comparative panel. So we have six countries represented today. First, we'll have Georgina Ya Oduro, who's the Director of, C uh, of the Center for Gender research, advocacy, and documentation, and also a senior lecturer in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. We also have Norzaini Azman, who is a professor of higher education at the University Kebangsan, you'll have to tell me if I pronounce that right, uh, Zaini, and in Malaysia. We also have Alma Maldonado Maldonado, who's a researcher at the Department of Educational Researcher at the Center for Research and Advanced Studies in Mexico. We have Adele Moodley, who is registrar and also adjunct professor at the Rhodes Business School and at Rhodes University in South Africa. We have Alia Kuzubakova, who's the Associate Professor of Higher Education Leadership at Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. And lastly, we have Amalia Diorio, who's Professor of Finance and also the Associate Provost International and Academic Partnerships at La Trobe University in Australia. And I should, I should mention Amalia very recently, a few days ago, was made a member of the Order of Australia for her significant service to tertiary education and to women's 
issues in particular. So we're really delighted to have Amalia finishing up the comparative panel today. And then last but not least, we will have some concluding remarks by uh, Tessa Delaquil, who is a doctoral candidate and also a research associate at CIG who wrote the contributing, or rather the concluding contribution for the brief. So with uh, no further ado, I will pass on to Robin. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And welcome everyone to today's webinar. As Rebecca said, I'm Robin Matras Helms, Assistant Vice President at the American Council on Education, or ACE. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our hosts, the Center for Global Higher Education, for the opportunity to be here today. We're grateful for the invitation to feature the new International Brace for Higher Education Leaders publication and our stellar authors speaking on the important topic of women's leadership in higher education around the world. We are also grateful to the Boston College Center for International Higher Education, or CIHE, for their partnership, not only on this installment of the brief, but for the longstanding and fruitful collaboration between ACE and CIHE over the past decade. The International Briefs publication has been a cornerstone of this collaboration. This ninth install, as Rebecca had said, this is the ninth installment in the series, which began as a mechanism to deliver concise, action-oriented information to US higher education leaders seeking to establish partnerships with institutions abroad. Over time though, with support from CIHE and its global network, the publication's scope has expanded to focus on global higher education issues with a comparative lens for a truly global audience. We're especially excited about this installment of the brief because it brings together a number of ACE's current priorities. So ACE serves as the major coordinating body for US higher education with about 1700 institutional members representing all sectors of US higher education from community colleges through doctoral institutions. Our work focuses on advocacy, both in the formal policy sense and serving more broadly as a voice for US higher education inside and outside the US, producing higher, high quality research and delivering programs designed to empower leaders and transform institutions. Women's higher education leadership has been an integral component of ACE's work for decades, including our robust ACE Women's Network and the Moving the Needle Initiative. And we're currently in the midst of a strategic planning process for ACE's global engagement. A key priority for us going forward is bringing comparative perspectives to critical higher education issues. This installment of the brief and the insights on global women's leadership and recommended action steps it provides represents exactly the type of work we hope to do more of in the research realm. And today's comparative discussion among experts and practitioners from around the world is a great example of the types of events ACE hopes to be part of on an array of global higher education issues. We hope that this will be one of many conversations along these lines with all of you going forward. And with that, I am excited for us to get started. Many thanks again to the Center for Global Higher Education, CIHE, our panelists, and to all of you for being part of today's events. Back over to you, Rebecca. Thanks so much. I'm just bringing up the slides and I invite Gina, who's our first panelist, to kick us off. Hello, good afternoon from Ghana. Um, I'm speaking on the topic, women's leadership in Ghanaian higher educational institution, looking at the concept of tokenism, equality and equity. And this uh, brief was written by three of us, but I'm presenting on behalf of the team. So we start by arguing that in Ghanaian higher educational sector, there are very few women there. And because of the few women, it also reflects in leadership or management. So for example, if you take data from the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission, we have about 60% male faculty and then 40% women faculty, but then it's graduate. So out of this 60, 40% ratio, we have more younger or more um, lower skill women at the basic level in terms of assistant lecturers and then lecturers. And as we move up, it's really low. So at the University of Cape Coast, where I am, we have two um, women co-professors in active service as at now. And this reflects when it comes to positions at the management level, that's how I'm starting. And there are so many factors contributing to that. So you realize that there are three pictures on my slide. The woman on top was the very first female vice chancellor that the university had. Um, about eight ago. So she sort of broke the uh, glass ceiling and after her, we've had some other female vice chancellors. The one below in the green cap is the current female vice chancellor for one of our male dominated universities, which is the University for 
um, science and technology. And then the one in blue is our current pro-vice chancellor, who is also the very first woman pro-vice chancellor. So it's like that in most, all, almost all the public universities in the country. And the factors definitely come from patriarchy in terms of socialization, in terms of um, the society seeing the essence of educating more males than females. So it, it radiates or it runs through. So when we come to the third point, which we've captioned the leaky pipeline syndrome, what we're arguing is that at the basic level, when it comes to basic education, primary level, we have almost 100% male-female ratio. But as we move up to the uh, class six, primary class six, which is a transitional point to junior high school, a lot of the females drop. So that is where the leaky pipeline starts. They drop and it's a myriad of factors, teenage pregnancy and financial issues, a whole lot of issues which time will not permit me. And then from the junior high school level to senior high school level, we have another drop. And then from senior high school level to universities, there's also drop. And when it comes to subject areas, we have the gender subject issues. So in the social sciences and the arts, we have comparatively more women. So the 40, 60% runs there. But when it comes to the STEM, science, technology, uh, 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 mathematics oriented subjects, it's really, really few women in there. There are so many few women in there. And then also we don't really have strong national institutional supportive policies. What do we mean by that? Each university is sort of autonomous. So at the national level, we don't have a, we have a, a national policy in terms of gender policy for the country, yes. But in terms of policy spe specifically for education or female education at the national level, no. We are still struggling with our affirmative action policy, which is back and forth, a parliament and all that. So it's very much about your individual ability or capacity to really fight. So it's a male dominated scene when it comes to promotion is the same um, policies required of men as against women. When there, there are actually no supportive female structures in terms of childcare and all that. So it's about women juggling between all this and at the same time making it. That's why we have so few of them. And at the University of Cape Coast, if you want to become a vice chancellor, you have to be a full professor. And as I said, that's now we have only two women and four professors. So straight away, women are weeded out of the competition. The issue of tokenism, in this policy, we interviewed five women because we wanted their voices, we wanted experiences. And the five women said that, like the scene I've presented, it hasn't been easy. But then it's very much about when you are there, you are one among a lot. So you go for a committee meeting, you go for a board meeting, you are virtually the only female. And so it's more of a token because they are, we are making consensus, we are taking views and you are one among a lot. And there are so many boards and committees where we don't have women there at all. So then the question is, are we really being represented? Is it an issue of equality? Is it an issue of equity or it's more of tokenism? And from the five women, it's very much a, a case of tokenism. That was a conclusion that was drawn. So now we argue that if we are going to have more women then there is the need for mentorship because there we are currently the University of Cape Coast, we are developing a gender policy. We've not had a gender policy. We have a sexual harassment policy in the university, but not a gender policy. The university was established in 1962. So since 1962, there hasn't been a gender policy. So you can imagine. So everything is very much on merit, on struggle, on your ability, and then all that. So some of the voices coming in our consensus to build the policy is that we should mentor, we should create a bigger base so that we can get the people from this base to lead. Because it's not about just picking and picking because there are few women in the system. So you pick and then push this person in this hole. But rather, we should have a strategic plan. So if 10, 15 years to groom more women, say that we have the base to appoint out of it. So that is one of the voices coming. In terms of supportive network also, women should build supportive network, writing workshops and other things that will help them progress. Because to them, it's going to be about merit rather than sort of being given preferential treatment. So that is it. And then there is also the need for more advocacy. So there are so many factors that could be discussed, but with my time limitation, this is where I, I picked it from. So that is the situation in the Ghanaian context. So there are very few women up there when it comes to leadership and management. Thank you very much from Ghana. Thank you, Gina, on our whistle stop around the world, off to Malaysia. Thank you. 
Um, for Malaysia, um, nearly half the population um, uh, are women. And uh, in the school system, girls generally do better than boys in terms of achievement. Um, and as a result, more women, uh, an average of 65 to 70% than men are enrolled in higher education, uh, more in undergraduate level uh, and master's level as compared to the PhD level. Um, the female labor force participation is actually more than men, which is about you know, close to 60%. Uh, in, the high, uh, in the higher education uh, sector, Malaysian women uh, help more than um, half, nearly 60% of the full-time academic post in public universities. So these all show that Malaysia has progressed well in terms of uh, female achievement and access to higher education policy, meaning that some of the policies for women equality um, has, has worked um, rather well. However, higher education remains one of the uh, sectors where women are still underrepresented in both academic and managerial or institutional leadership. So in the 20 public universities, we see that women professors accounted only about a third of professors. For distinguished professor designations, these are recognitions of professors' outstanding scholarship and expertise. Um, just about 22 out of 51 um, uh, excellence award uh, were given to women. Now, um, for institutional leadership, bearing in mind these are appointments made by the Ministry of Higher Education, i.e. the minister, or i.e. is a political uh, appointment, very few women have been appointed. As of 2020, only two out of the 20 VCs of public universities um, are women, and five of all VCs of research universities are men, despite the fact that the majority of those in research universities, uh, students and, and, and um, uh, female professors, um, um, the majority are in these uh, research universities. Um, for the board of governors or directors of those public universities, only 5% um, uh, was appointed uh, to lead um, uh, as a leader of the board. And out of 199 board members appointed um, uh, by the government, only 21% are women. So um, there is only uh, basically a, about 40% of women uh, in leadership positions, managing finance, human resources uh, uh, of, of public universities. So a few women in leadership position means that we are underrepresented in all decision-making, um, which means that there is a lot, a lack of women voices, interests and concerns in decision-making. It also means that the expertise and skills of, uh, you know, about 60% of, of the women workforce are being underutilized. And I think this is a failure to maximize talents which uh, Malaysia is in dire need of. So women representation in leadership of edu uh, the higher education sector has not reached the critical mass set by the government, which is 30%. In fact, it is lower compared to, compared to other Asian countries. So what are the lingering issues? Some are really personal issues uh, for the women themselves. Some are cultural and of course some are organizational or policy in nature. Basically, many women lack ambition to rise to the top um, uh, ladder. This is perhaps related to the third issue, uh, whereby female academics tend not to share the values of the neoliberal, uh, neoliberal uh, system, the need to be very competitive. If you're a leader, you need to uh, really excel um, to ensure that your university is an uh, entrepreneurial university, perform um, all sorts of measures, especially uh, KPIs, heavy load that come with managing large public universities in Malaysia. Of course, uh, uh, glass ceilings and walls have been there. And I argue that it is more of cultural nature than from religious beliefs um, and, and men uh, feel very uncomfortable dealing with women leaders. Um, of course, misconceptions of women leadership and merit um, uh, because of gender bias and lack of transparency in selection and promotion uh, processes. On top of that, uh, women sometimes do not value other women promoted as leaders um, due to, again, I think it's misconception that women tend to overstate their assertiveness, autonomy and authority, although these were the perceptions that were gained from uh, research by uh, Molly in 2017. Um, Lack of access to women peers, as said before, uh, role model mentors, uh, women reluctance to apply for higher promotion means they are invisible to the decision makers, to the ministers, to those in the Ministry of Higher Education. 
women do not have social capital in the form of network and political connections. Uh, men usually have a lot of sponsorship. Uh, since those in the authority, um, particularly in the Ministry of uh, edu Higher Education, uh, those who are appointing top leadership posts are mostly men. There's cloning is rampant, meaning that um, male decision makers tend to select people within their circle and people who, has, who are similar to them. Um, so they are replacing someone who's very much like them. Uh, so suffice to say that the progress in women in higher education has been slower than any uh, in any uh, than other sectors, particularly in, in the entrepreneurial or business sectors. In fact, I would say that the trend has regressed uh, as compared to um, years before this. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Zaini. I'm afraid, unfortunately, I don't think Alma is here. So I'm going to skip through her slide and go directly to you, Abel, if that's okay. So if we can move right to the South African context. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my context will be a South African context. And I'd just like to give a little bit of a background to say that we attained democracy in 1994. And post-democracy, we have 26 public universities in which there are only six women as vice chancellors as in 2021, which makes a, a total of 23%. On the positive side, we do have an increasing number of women as deputy vice chancellors coming through the system, making up 52% in the portfolios of academic and research. We also have an increasing number of women coming through in our political leadership um, since we uh, post-democracy. My focus would be more on the construct of, of leadership, and I'd like to focus more on what that should be. And I argue that it, um, in terms of the construct of leadership, it, it demands a review of the notions of leadership in terms of gendered traits, which were the, were the traditionally perceived gendered norms. A construct of leadership should embrace men and women as having leadership competencies and capabilities. We should move away from looking at leadership in terms of being gender associated. It is an ever evolving construct and it must be responsive to the context and beyond. And if we look at what we are going through right now, for example, in the South African context, we have had in the higher education sector, the 2015 and 2016 fallist protests, and we also have the international COVID-19 pandemic. We, we need to look at leadership as a way of preempting and analyzing and recognizing what is expected within certain contexts. And in doing so, we recognize that um, our education um, context is forever changing, it is volatile, and it is constantly transforming. And this demands a resilience and an agility and an ability to innovate, which means we must move away from looking at leadership in terms of gendered norms. It remains our responsibility to expand the frontiers of knowledge. And I'd like to share just briefly, in terms of conversations that I've had with women in South African universities in, in positions of leadership of um, deans, uh, deputy vice chancellors and vice chancellors and what has come through in terms of those conversations. Mostly um, these conversations confirm the experiences and existence of hegemonic cultural traditions which dictate the traditional roles of men and women. And I think this is also being um, reiterated by my fellow presenters. But I don't want to necessarily focus on this. Rather, I ask the question, what inspires women to pursue leadership? And what is important here is to reflect on the conversations and, and, and the responses in terms of these conversations. Personal interest is something which is, which is um, very much part of the reasons why women pursue leadership, but more so active encouragement encouragement and affirmation, both from colleagues, as well as from oneself, self-affirmation has also um, contributed to women taking up positions of leadership. So we ask ourselves, as um, we've been doing, what is needed to support women? The agency of those in leadership to acknowledge women's competencies as leaders is an, an imperative. There's also a need for constructive programs that address social and cultural 
constructs that impede women's trajectories. And in South Africa, we have a number of those within the higher education sector. I've just put down a few there, the University of South Africa program, HOME and HER South Africa are just a few of those. But most importantly, women must be emboldened, emboldened to confidently and without fear of harassment, take up the challenge of leadership. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Adele. Alia? Hello, uh, greetings from Kazakhstan. Um, I represent the Zerbaik University in Kazakhstan. So um, if you, uh, Kazakhstan became independent in 1991. And uh, at this point, uh, at least based on statistics from 2019, about 24% of women uh, occupied higher education leadership positions. And this is the simplest statistics, but to, to make it more complicated, there, uh, most of the women tend to assume leadership positions in, in the academic track. And there are much less women who are uh, like the number of women in leadership position decreases as we go up the academic uh, hierarchy. So there are much less women who are vice rectors and even less who are rectors. Um, contextually, Kazakhstan is actually performing well in terms of gender parity. So it co it's comparable to many uh, Western European countries. And in some data, it even surpasses some of the European countries, Western countries. Uh, uh, there are women in parliament. There are some women who take ministerial chairs. Uh, but the picture in general is complicated. So once women start to get to power, um, there is a there is a differentiation to what kind of uh, leadership positions they are assigned, and these tend to be leadership positions conventionally associated with uh, care and with female type of prof um, profile. Um, there is also policy documents which regulate uh, gender policy, you know, for example, the Consumption for Family and Gender Policy has the target by 2030 to increase women representation leadership to 30 um, percent. The problem is there is no underlying um, research uh, going on and also there is no specific, very specific action plans. Uh, I don't want to repeat lots of things that were uh, said by the colleagues. Uh, in terms of the factors which affect women advancement, because some of these factors are shared with other contexts, and these are psychosocial factors that is that women tend to have tend to be socialized into uh, gender like uh, into norms which um, um, kind of make them prone to uh, more to upbringing and kids upbringing and care roles in the family. And uh, this has influence on their identity and behaviors, meaning that they have lower expectations. Um, they do not aspire for leadership roles. Typically, they are appointed to leadership roles rather than self-nominate. And in general, try to uh, they avoid leadership roles throughout the whole society, not only in higher education. Um, another set of factors are related to uh, can be explained by gender organization theory. So, in general, views uh, on women's career in the society. Um, are still uh, pretty much conservative so that <clears throat> uh, women are not expected to be leaders, they're expected to take uh, and with and in the organization, it's the male figure that that expected by most of the organizations and employees. So when women get, women get to leadership positions, they are evaluated lower and they also tend to be promoted um, to a less extent. Um, but more interestingly, in Kazakhstan, there are particular informal communication patterns which prevent women from socialization into leadership roles. And in some ways, it's similar to many Western societies, uh, whereby uh, when, uh, when decisions which are important, leadership decisions are made, they are made in informal settings during soccer games, during, um, you know, beer hours uh, outside the working hours. And because women have motherhood responsibilities and they have to be at home after hours, they cannot participate in these informal meetings. Um, and you can see all sorts of interesting strategies, especially among younger generation of women who has five leadership roles where they start to play soccer together with guys where they actually do but until they are married and until they have kids, they try to go with guys and socialize them in the bars. Um, uh, another set of uh, factors are related to professionalization theory. So this uh, this uh, theory is very uh, is playing out clearly in Kazakhstan. There are two career 
paths, academic career path and um, administrative career path, women tend to assume leadership positions in academic spheres. Uh, so they tend to become um, chairs, vi like vice chairs, chairs, vice deans, deans, and then go up to uh, provost positions, but they are very unlikely to become rectors because rectorship position assumes that a person has is more of an administrator rather than an academic leader. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, males tend to rotate um, in the administration, so they go from the positions in, in universities to other political positions in the government uh, or in other non-academic organizations, while women tend to stick uh, to universities, and because the operation of university is very much dependent on academic leadership, um, uh, uh, they, uh, women tend to be assigned to academic leadership rather than males because they're more stable in the organization. They are very unlikely to leave. And um, academic positions are also associated with lots of work hours, uh, with uh, lots of workload and um, lots of um, detailed um, uh, bureaucratic type of responsibilities. And women tend to be kind of downgraded to these responsibilities and guys don't want, um, males don't want this kind of responsibilities. Um, and so once the, the ceiling of these academic positions is reached, which is provost, where women tend to uh, drop out, they don't go anywhere further. There are some unique uh, factors which play out in Central Asia, and I'm very interested to see whether similar things are happening in other countries, especially in Asia. Uh, one is, is probably um, a, a common to other post-Soviet contexts, uh, because uh, during the Soviet times, uh, lots of women liberalization, liberalization uh, took place. Uh, uh, lots of uh, measures were taken by the Soviet government to make sure that women go to the labor force. For example, um, there's a very uh, good um, package for childcare, for uh, prenatal care, postnatal care of kids, and etc. Uh, there are different social payments to support uh, childcare, and organizations cannot easily fire women when they take care of uh, underage kids. Um, the uh, women actually have better chances to have a career of some sort than in other contexts. But at the same time, um, women in Kazakhstan, especially women of different generations, uh, face a mixture of different um, uh, gender, role, gender role expectations. Some of them originate from the traditional society. Uh, in when Kazakhstan became independent in 1991, uh, we had the revival of national identity. And with that, we had come back to some of the traditional norms um, and traditional expectations from women. And they were also intermingled with the return of Islamic, um, Islamic uh, expectations. And so in some ways, um, uh, there are parochial, uh, very often family-related expectations from women leaders, which prevent them from the career. On the other hand, there is this liberal liberalizing of Soviet gender norms, which expect women to work, which expect women to, but at the same time, expect women to take care of, the, of children. And there are also some of the Western norms that are gradually creeping in. And uh, <clears throat> these actually are, uh, um, are very aggressive in terms of women liberalization to the point that now males are expected also to take care of kids and sometimes to take the primary responsibility for childcare. And, and uh, on the one hand, different generations face different set of roles. On the other hand, one single woman faces the three different sets of roles simultaneously. And the way it affects leadership is that uh, women have to very often assume perform, uh, performativity type of um, uh, 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 strategies where they have to play different, different kind of different roles, different identities, different people, depending on what kind of roles they face. So if she sits in the meet, for example, if she's a leader, she sits in the meeting of other guys in a similar position, um, sometimes she has to serve tea to them, uh, uh, complying with parochial roles. On the other hand, when she's the boss in her own organization and she has a meeting where she is coordinating subordinates, she would act according to Western, uh, or, or for example, according to uh, Soviet norms. But then if she is in a Western style university or if she's in a private university when she's expected to perform more, perform you know, better similarly to guys, then she would actually show her Western identity. So it varies. But the more, most interesting set of factors is related to institutionalization theory. So in, uh, again, as a result of this interplay between um, parochial uh, traditional roles and um, post-Soviet norms, post-Soviet nomenclature roles, 
we have a high influence of informal social networks in Kazakhstan. And um, so that uh, lots of decisions are actually made not with informal network structures, but within informal network structures, which are related to clans. Uh, politically, um, there, is a, there are different political groups that influence decisions. And uh, the, the, the thing is that rectors of the universities, uh, they used to be appointed in the past by the president. And so they, when they were appointed, uh, very often the position of a rector served as a trial place for guys before they move to a more important political position. When guys come to power, they bring other members of their own team of their, within their social network. And women have trouble getting into that team who are from within the university because it's expected the team moves from university to university while women uh, cannot move they are they are stick to they are stuck to their family also uh, socialization with these, these informal social networks requires uh, participation in gift giving and uh, uh, events which are related to gift giving in so uh, different informal celebrations for example where a woman is is expected to pay and she can like to pay in the form of gifts and she cannot do that because very often due to parochial expectation she cannot be responsible for the family budget so it's it's very complicated you can read the brief you can read the original article that the brief is based on but i wanted to highlight these two very unique features for central asian and i want to hear from others whether you see the same things the for the future things may change first because of covid so it's definitely going to affect the position of women in kazakhstan i don't know how yet and the second we had a reform in the governance of higher education now the rectors are not appointed anymore they're elected and that may have an impact on whether women will be promoted or not so that's thank it. you Ilya. And our last country on our whistle stop tour is australia so amalia over to you Thank you so much, Rebecca, and hello from Melbourne, Australia. As a country, Australia has been relatively progressive in addressing gender equality issues in the workplace. The Australian government passed the first piece of legislation to address gender discrimination in employment in 1986, and the current legislation, the Workplace Gender Equality Act, was introduced in 2012. These have provided clear guidelines for Australian universities to develop strategies and initiatives to address gender inequality, both at the institutional level and as a sector. The sector's peak body, Universities Australia, actively promotes gender equality in higher education. The good news is that in Australia, we have almost achieved gender balance with women representing 48% of all academic staff in 2019. The not so good news is that persistent underrepresentation of women in leadership positions, as we've heard from other speakers tonight. Across the 39 Australian universities, 11 vice chancellors or presidents and 10 chancellors are female. A major challenge is that progressing up the leadership ladder, ladder is dependent on research performance. And this is often a dilemma for women who are more inclined to take career breaks or work part-time and therefore interrupt their research output. In response, Australian universities have developed programs to support female academics who have had career interruptions. At the national level, the Australian Government funds Science in Australia SAGE Athena Swan program, for example, and funding bodies such as the Australian Research Council are working with the higher education sector to develop measures to achieve gender parity in research funding applications. Despite these accomplishments, however, recent events have reminded us that progress is not guaranteed and advancements are not always sustainable. Immediate drop in international enrolments and a pivot to online delivery for all programs has had a devastating effect on the workforce of every Australian university. Compounding the impact are the added responsibilities of childcare, homeschooling and other family ob obligations, and so intensifying gender inequalities. Unsurprisingly, a recent Australian study indicates women have experienced, amongst other things, 
added caring responsibilities, excessive workloads in teaching and little opportunity for research. So the largely positive re record of progress on gender equality in Australia's university sector is now at a critical juncture. As universities make hard choices in response to the impact of COVID, their choices about where spending and support are maintained will provide a very clear signal of underlying commitment to the gender equality across to gender equality across the sector. So we'll see. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Amalia. And for our last word, I turn to Tessa. I don't believe Tessa has any slides, so I've taken this slide share off. Tessa, over to you. Thank you, Rebecca. For the next few minutes, I'd just like to briefly tie together some of the common threads we see across our country studies in the brief. I'd like to draw out in particular the unfinished nature of the project of achieving gender equality in women's leadership in higher education. And I think we can see some commonalities across the country context. So we have to recognize that this um, human right is met through individual and collective action. Um, in terms of the partial nature of the international movement for the achievement of this human right, for representation of women in leadership in general and in higher education in particular, it's partial in terms of context. So we see that at national regional levels. It's partial also because of different cultural and historical tropes. And it's also partial by individuals. So there are other factors of marginalization that um, exist within the complexity of our identities. And barriers also occur at all three of these levels, thinking about it sort of national, regionally, cultural, or individually. So supports thus must also occur at all three of these levels in order to be effective. And in fact, looking at the country context in our brief, we see when one of these levels lacks support, the overall project seems to fail or stagnate. So structural injustice then must be met by procedural justice, building in national policy level changes. Cultural changes may begin within institutions requiring both institutional level changes and vocal leadership and modeling and encouragement and support to individuals. Um, in terms of the partial nature, you see a general paucity of women in leadership, even in countries where representation in the pipeline reaches parity. It varies again by national or regional context. And in terms of intersectionality, you can come to our Thursday talk and learn more about that. Um, for barriers that occur in society, we see higher education as a microcosm within the greater society. And so um, it's pervaded by the aspects um, embedded in our communities. Of course, we cannot address all causes of gender imbalance within our institutions, but we're also not powerless. So the glass ceiling that's maintained at least in part through structural cultural complacency within our institutions and our academic communities, we can change in part and we can also support change in our society as we work um, towards social change for the public good in our institutions. And so we see barriers at societal levels, we see barriers institutionally and societally. Um, and so our supports must address these barriers societally, institutionally, individually um, through policies and programming. We also see a need for sex disaggregated data collection institutionally and publicly for policy decision-making support. In conclusion, our universities may exist as a countercultural space in which justice is achieved through procedural and structural change towards shifting our cultural approach to women in leadership. Our contexts are always changing, which is another factor we've seen with global crises like COVID-19, the refugee crisis, and others. Um, and we must not permit that most significant barrier to women's equality in higher education take hold. That is the tenacious complacency within our communities, which sort of lets us stagnate and wallow in spaces of ongoing injustice. Rather, we, must, we have the initial tools that we need to affect some change. And so we must work towards achieving true gender equality within our academic communities and within our institutions with the hope that we are building towards achieving the human right beyond our universities to the nation, our nations and our world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tessa, and thank you to the panel. We were probably slightly over uh, op optimistic and thinking we could keep to 30 minutes, but we're, we still do have time for questions and answers. I see there's a few questions that have come through, but I invite others to, to post their questions as well. I'm wondering, Simon, if it might be okay in the interest of time to invite maybe two or three people to ask their questions so that the panel could respond all at once. Um, if that sounds okay, it looks like we have that uh, Glenn Chatelier and uh, Pamela Payne and So Young Lee have each asked a question. So I would like to invite the three of them in that order to ask their questions to the panel. So Glenn, you're first. Um, 
My th thank you. Can you hear me? I, I I don't know if that's yes audible enough. Um, I really enjoyed all the presentations, and my question really is to Gina. Uh, in your presentation, you tended to suggest uh, uh, that that there was, to a certain extent, the lack of societal progress uh, relative to women leadership. And my question to you is, uh, you know, uh, uh, would you substantiate that through research, or do you think that there should be more social action to promote women into leadership in HEI? in higher education institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Pamela, do you want to ask your question? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I just, my question was, is how can I as an individual support more gender balance, not only in my own organization, but also on a global level? What are some just, I don't know, some things that I can, some practical things that I can do um, on a daily basis. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for that, Pamela. And last but not least, So Young Lee, I see you had two questions, but um, if you want to ask, ask at least the first one for starters, that would be great. Okay, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you everyone for your great presentation. So my question is, I'm wondering um, what does this comparative analysis of women leadership in different contexts say about internationalization of academic staff in higher education? A great question. I think you're, you're asking about, you know, are women moving more to, to seek uh, representation or more opportunities in other contexts outside of their own if it's difficult in their own context or whether that was that was spoken Exactly. Um, about in any of the contributions. So I'll turn to the panel. You're welcome to take any of those. Um, would any of our panelists be willing to address one or more of those questions for starters? Okay. I guess, um, Gina, there was a question right for you. Yeah, <laughs> great. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And then it's great having you all and then listening to the other contest and learning from the other contest as well. Definitely, there are some commonalities or similarities in our experiences. And then with Glenn's question, whether there have been some positive response to women in higher education, definitely yes. Because until recently, like I said, with the three women on my slide, the woman on top, we started that I was in 2000 and Talk there about she was a very first female vice chancellor and it was unheard of when she became it was such of a sensation in the country lots of interviews from the media and other things and since her there have been others and as I said currently so there's been some positive reaction or response to women leadership but society still appreciate and even now at the national level when it comes to national politics some political parties are also filing women as possible vice presidential candidates. There were, I think, two filed for national presidential candidates as well. So there's definitely been a shift, but it's a gradual thing. As we know, I'm a sociologist and in sociology, it's about behavioral change. It doesn't take off in seconds. But after the first woman, there have been others. Till now, I can't say that Ghana has had up to 10 women vice chancellors, no but we've made a huge shift and she did it and society got to know that it's possible. But what we are arguing is that we need more supportive system policies in place so that it's not all about how you sort of swim, how you manage it, and then your own peculiar experiences. But what can we nationally, if there's a national policy, support so for example when it comes to balls and committees at least we need 20 percent female representation we need 30 percent but also with the mentorship and all that that is a bit encouraging but if you are left to sort of swim on your own then it's about how fast you can swim or how good you are which becomes a bit problematic so yes there has been a shift but it's still very relative because there are serious social impediments in place for women but there has been a positive shift to that and we are actually thinking of uh, studying on women in higher education. I think Lynn also mentioned it. Even the data we got for this um, policy brief, because of the word limitation, we just shifted the few points. So we intend to develop it into a full paper with the voices on the various themes and then maybe even expand it beyond our own university to other universities. So it's something that we are looking at based on this policy brief we've done. And at best, I also have done six studies. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you, Gina. Does anybody <laughs> want to address either of the other questions about internationalization, how that how, of um, faculty and how that might play into these dynamics and or any individual things that we all could be doing? Can I actually answer that question? I think this is an excellent question and it uh, hit my major interest in the internationalization of higher education so only. So you just gave me a bunch of research ideas. <coughs> I, can, I cannot answer this question based on the research that I conducted in Kazakhstan because in my research, I looked at women leaders in higher education who are Kazakhstanis. But based on my experience as a faculty member in a highly internationalized university, in Azerbaijan University in Kazakhstan, and also based on my recent experience as an immigrant in Canada, I actually, I think I can answer this question to some extent. So uh, there are lots of, I think my prediction is that international mobility actually is more like, well, the effect of international mobility on the opportunities of women as a leader within academic settings is probably going to depend on the direction of the mobility and also who, who is moving. So if you, let's say, if we take the context of Kazakhstan, the context of an international university in a country with a lower level of research capacity and a lower, like low, um, less developed high education system, if we, if we can talk about less developed. Uh, so the context of Kazakhstan, uh, uh, from my research based on international mobility of women faculty, uh, within this context, women coming from the West actually have better opportunities for advancement uh, than within their own countries. Uh, because there is lots of confusion about cultural norms and cultural expectations. Within the context of international university, nobody knows what is the real set of norms that you have to comply with. So women have the power to play out with these roles to actually advance. Second, within the context of Kazakhstan, by Kazakhstanis, especially if they come from the West, they're going to be perceived as having better capacity of, of, uh, for leadership because this is the typical why, like, white person phenomena. So when they come to the context of a non, you know, um, to the context of the non-Western society, they tend to have this talk, uh, like they have, tend to be tokens of Western culture and then that, and that empowers them. So they, they are more likely to achieve advancement in my view. Also within the context of this universities, uh, sometimes uh, good opportunities are provided in terms of childcare, like, in Kazakhstan, for example, we have a campus which has residential facilities, which have daycare right there on campus. So in some ways, they are going to benefit from being able to balance their work life and, um, and their family life better than in the context of a conventional university where they come from. On the other hand, if you look at my own experience moving to Canada, I'm actually very, I'm very much lost from that moment. And I moved for family reasons, acting like a conventional Kazakhstani woman who complies with general expectations of being a good mom versus a good professional. So I came to Canada with PhD from the United States, which should be valued well, right? But then I came from a minority, visible minority, because I'm Asian. I come from a country which is pretty much um, unnoticeable within the uh, global academic culture. Uh, you know, it's not the conventional China, it's not the conventional like rising tiger of Asia, it's not Russia, it's not, it's somewhere out there in Central Asia that nobody knows about. So when I even apply for jobs in academia, I think I'm sort of, I'm not as, I'm, I, I suffer the negative token phenomena where my, um, uh, U.S. education is devalued, where research conducted in nobody knows context of Kazakhstan is devalued, where I lost my social networks and lots of my social capital, where I, I'm also not quite familiar with the culture because Canadian culture and society and gender norms expectations differ from those in the United States where I was educated. So on in lo in lots of fronts, I'm very much like any other immigrant, and I, I lost in that respect. I can imagine if I got a job as a faculty member, uh, rather than if I moved as an immigrant and then tried to look for a job, I would probably face similar challenges because of my background, because of, my, of the way I look and because of the kind of research that I conduct. So I'm now intrigued to see to what extent that's my personal experience and to what extent that actual experience of other people. So if you are interested, let's start doing something together <laughs> on this topic. <laughs> Thanks, Aliyah. Great that new research projects are coming out of this. That's wonderful. So you, as no one else has posted a question, would you like the last word? Do you want to ask your second question? I think Adele, for one, yeah. might be interested in coming in on that one. Uh, thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. I saw the second question and I thought it was important to consider that. Um, I think there's a question that someone posed also, what can I do? 
in my own individual capacity. And I think it depends where you are positioned within your institution or even within your, um, your, your, your community, because your voice, as much as what we believe our voices to be singular, we, the more voices there are in these spaces, the more we amplify the message. And I would think that wherever you network, wherever you socialize, wherever you engage, regardless of gender, I think we must, we, must, we must try and move ourselves outside of those gendered norms and socialize beyond that and challenge ourselves. That is why I spoke to the issues of being confident and self-confident. And um, I think Soyang Lee's question goes about what's the, the relationship between your own strength and your own inner confidence and how do you go beyond that in terms of the barriers that you that we all experience within within various contexts? And for me, it's important that that self confidence there has to be an energy within yourself, and you must be able to, um, in order to motivate others, you must be able to look at yourself and be able to have a sense of confidence about who you are, and and how you engage and 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 deliberate around these. So I think for me, it's, it's a very um, strong sense of self and, and, and you have to have a sense of confidence and then take that and recognize others within your domain or even beyond your community and, and start building those networks and support. So that, that's what I would contribute. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Adele. And thank you um, to everybody for the questions. I've noticed there's a couple more that have come in. I might just uh, abuse my chair position here. Mariko's question about whether there is any global research comparing expected roles and responsibilities of female leaders. That's a very good question. Um, certainly we were trying to start um, a little bit this with the brief. So do take a look at what we've produced so far. I'm unfamiliar with any other work that's being done recently, but if anyone in the panel knows of anything that has been comparative in its scope, looking at roles and responsibilities, it'd be great if you could maybe just type that into the chat. I think that might be an easier one in the chat. Um, and I do see we have one last question, but before I turn over to the very last question, just because I know some people might leave at the hour, um, just to plug one more time, our second webinar in this series, which is on Thursday morning with a different panel, also contributors to the brief. What we're looking at on Thursday is a very strong theme that came through all of the comparative analysis. And that was the importance of diversity, nuance, intersectionality within this question of gender equality. We've been talking today mostly about women aspiring to the leadership in the first place and acquiring leadership positions in the first place. But uh, on Thursday's panel, we're going to look at when you break down the data, what that looks like within it, what kinds of leadership positions are women able to access, what kinds of institutions are more supportive at um, welcoming aspiring women and, and how do individual identities play into this? How do particular marginalized identities have a harder time accessing leadership positions than others? So if you're interested in that aspect of it, I really very much encourage you to register for the second webinar on Thursday and to join us. And I'll also plug that um, early in the chat, I did post the link to the publication and do take a look at that if you would like to. But I think I, we would like to close on time, but I do want to be sure to acknowledge that there is one last question, um, and that was coming from Julie Lin. And Julie, if you want to ask your question, feel free, and if any panelists would like to respond, that'd be great. And then after that, we will finish up. Julie, are you there? Yes, um, thank you. And sorry for stalking, slowing up everybody's time. Um, so I'm wondering, because um, I'm from Taiwan, which is quite, uh, they are changing, they are changing gender equality concepts, but then it definitely clashes with the traditional cultural um, practices. So um, is there any current practice in the world now that's from a more in, uh, institutional, systematic way or like national policy that can substantially support the women in their career? It's beyond academic, I understand, but we just like to hear whether there is any practice that's going on. Amalia, would you like to speak to that from the Australian context, the policies that have been supportive in, in reaching the achievements that have been um, reached in Australia? Uh, yes, so from a national perspective, uh, there have been, um, there have been uh, legislative frameworks that have helped uh, to advance uh, women's careers. Um, Universities, for example, just picking up on some a specific uh, um, issue that you were talking about, university campuses 
have uh, childcare uh, facilities, for example. Uh, we have flexible um, uh, work, work work plans, um, but you know, culturally, often uh, the woman is is expected or, or has um, more caring responsibilities than, than men do. So. It's, it's quite difficult, even though there may be legislative uh, frameworks that help women uh, in many ways, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't help completely, if I were to say that. And COVID, I think, has shown that um, women do bear the, the brunt of uh, caring uh, um, responsibilities, homeschooling, um, so it's really, really difficult, Julie. Um, I, I think some uh, countries have moved towards remedying uh, the issue, but in, in times of, of crisis, as we've just had, um, we can see that ultimately uh, women um, can't avoid some of the responsibilities that, that they have. Um, so I, I don't have... Um, an answer for you, which is uh, a, a book, if you like. Um, but uh, in Australia, it's it, we we have a better situation than in other in other countries. But again, as I said, it's it's not perfect, and studies have shown us that that women um, are feeling the the effects of of COVID, for example, more than men, um, which is impacting on their careers. Thank you so much, Amalia. Yes, I, I did feel I had a bit of a meta existence as I worked on this project, as I literally barricaded the door against my children for running in in the middle of the webinar. So <laughs> it's a reality we all live. So thank you so much to the panel. I think we should probably close there. Just a, a few concluding remarks from me. First of all, we did put this panel together in a particular order we progressed from a country that had the least representation to the most but I think what's so in a way that's an inspiring lineup because you can see that countries have worked on this issue and I have made progress but at the same time there's a bit of a cautionary tale and that we can see in the last year um, as Amalia was just saying that crisis can revert us to to where we were before and that, that's an important thing for us all to keep in mind as we think about this issue so again if you're interested in the question of intersectionality and diversity within this do join us this Thursday um, there's a separate registration link for that which you can also find on the CG website do take a look at the publication and thanks so much everybody again for thanks to the panel for being here thank you so much to Simon for having us um, and thanks to all of you for being here. So over to you, Simon. Well, thank you, Rebecca. I mean, and thank you everyone for such a brilliant discussion. I think the fact that we had 125 people at the peak and held about 100 right through showed how important these issues are to, and, and, so, and how many people are in, and engaged in them on a daily basis. Um, I mean, thank you, Rebecca, especially for making this happen. Uh, you know, it's been, it's been a great experience for us to host this and we really pleased to be doing so again in two days time. Thank you, Trevor, too, too for making all the connections in the webinar happen. Um, as Rebecca said, in two days time, we resume the discussion, probe deeper on intersectionality and, uh, and, and those challenges. And um, Rebecca will be back, of course, chairing again. Uh, Robin will be here again, and we'll have Ashley Gray, Linda Chillen Lee, Joanna Rogalska, and Kristen Wren. So we look forward to seeing you in two days time again on the CG webinar with CIHE and ACE. Bye for now. <laughs>